people. So I'm actually going to be jumping between two slide decks today because I want to tell two different stories. But um, we'll start with this one just to kind of give us all context of what I'm going to talk about later. Um, so we'll be jumping around a little bit. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to talk about object fail. I don't care. It's irrelevant for what we're talking about. Um, but I'm interested in some of the things that we learned out of this and mostly how that whole system works. Not that it got leaked, don't care, whatever. But how it works is highly intriguing. Um, I'm going to tell the story in the context of having Ricky inform us of how things work. So Ricky cares about secrecy, and we're all going to learn from Ricky on that. So my open question to the audience as we come into this is, um, how many people run Android? OK. How many people compiled their own kernel? Like, have you looked at the source at all? Okay, awesome. Um, even if you had, you have absolutely no freaking clue what is running on your phone. You just don't. There's so many levels deeper than a, a typical application level source audit. There's levels deeper than a kernel source audit. Um, you really don't know what's going on your phone. Um, every presenter gives this, yay, this is me slide. Um, I don't care. At the end of this, you'll either believe what I said because I made sense or not. Um, but if you want to find me, I'm Monk Dot on Twitter, and I do put all my presentations online um, on GitHub. So if you want links or anything, it's better to get there than scramble and write. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about what malware and rootkits are, how they work, um, and then once we shift contexts from the private sector, uh, how that game changes, and then some fun tools that we can play with. So, boring kit. Uh, when I hear malware, I hear rootkit, I think spam. I get bored really, really, really fast. That is horribly lame. Um, yeah, no, no, no one that is actually doing anything interesting is, is using run of the mill malware or rootkits. Um, they steal all the credit cards. Uh, I don't care in the least. That is horribly boring. Um, they're not really doing anything interesting in code. Um, they're just iterative and boring. Mudge gave a great talk a couple years ago on, on this where basically it's a symbiotic relationship between McAfee and the other virus scanners and the malware guys. And both of them could up their game to the point that the other one would fail for six months. But the financial costs aren't there to do it. So it's just, you know, I roll out a botnet, I pop 50,000 boxes, I send a bunch of spam, McAfee catches me the next week. I make two code changes so my fingerprints are different. I roll back out. It's just this really lame, boring, capitalist market. Um, great. Can you not hear me at all? Oh, okay. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I can do here. Um, Okay, I always am horrible at the lapel, so I'll just hold it. Um, so public root kits, malware, spam, boring, everything, I don't care. Um, let's shift the game a little bit, though. Um, so for every game that we want to play, every advanced game, we need at least two players. We need game mechanics, and we need goals, um, right? So who is player one in our new malware game? Um, the nameless people. Uh, you can insert government. You can insert huge corporation. I don't care. Um, I'm not going to go on record and say who I think it is. But you know, have your minds have fun with this. Um, but basically, we're talking Bond villains or movie villains, um, or maybe even Ricky himself, right? Um, player two uh, is you. So get excited because you are the other player in this game. When we're talking advanced malware, um, and we are talking like game theory at this point, once we shift into a state-sponsored realm, we're definitely talking about O-Days. We're talking about all the O-Days. We're talking about that whole black market that you mythically hear about and people talk about on Twitter of, you know, yay, I sold this, I sold that. Yes, this is where they go. Um, people want something off a device they buy it, they pop it, they get what they want. So we need all of the O-Days, and we want all the O-Days for all the devices. 
the aliens themselves are still kind of boring. I mean, they're fascinating little pieces of code that do really cool things, but at the end of the day, they pop a root, right? Um, they get you on in the box. Uh, they cost a lot of money, and they're completely disposable to the people that are buying them. Um, you know, when we talk about the cost of a mobile, we talk about 20K. If you're the Glock, you're talking about 100K. You know, maybe, maybe you're a really badass old guy, and like, you get this much money for it, right? Like, even at that point, it is expendable and can be burned in a heartbeat if someone wants to get on your device. If they have this type of money to spend on an O-Day, they have a lot more to protect behind that, which is what we're going to talk about now. So we're going to hack all the devices. Really, in the modern day, this is our computer. This has everything on it. Like, I've got laptops at home, but really, all my finances, all my texts, all my emails, my whole life is my cell phone. And yeah, Android isn't any different. Just because it's open source doesn't mean it's secure. If I have money, I can buy an O'Day. I'm popped. You're dead. Um, same with iOS, same with BlackBerry. Uh, it's just how it works. So the interesting thing that we really want to talk about today, and what this whole kind of intro is about, is the game mechanics. So a good kit, a good implant, which is what you're actually doing with your O'Day, um, that actually takes real time to develop. You're not talking about one guy sitting in his mom's basement trying to crank out money. You're talking about lots of developers sitting in cubes, being bored, being more bored, having a real job. It sucks, but it pays the bills, and you're like, oh, this isn't exciting at all. But it costs a lot of money. I mean, you're talking, if you're going to pay half a million for an O-Day to pop someone, you're probably protecting a $20 million kit that's installed on their device. Um, you want that kit to be deep. Um, you don't want to lose that investment. So we want to hack all the things. We want to get everything in. But we really want is the data. We want all the cybers, right? So there's our game. There's our setup. This is how everything's going to work. Um, who wins? Yeah, not not you. you. You don't win because there's just unlimited money. Um, so getting back to that, we want to protect the real investment. We don't care about the O-Day. The O-Day is expendable. We want to be able to hide deeply whatever we've actually spent a lot of money developing, which is the tools that I tend to be fairly good at writing. So if you want to know more about the O-Day stuff, follow the Grek on Twitter. Um, it'll entertain you, I guess. Um, so this is where we switch slides. Yeah, so... I'm going to talk about two advanced projects here that you can use to deeply hide code running on a device. The first one is Nandex, and the second one is called Project Burner. Um, and they're just fun things that you can do with Android. So first, a little bit about NAND and how it works and how we defend against it. What I'm talking about, what I'll explain here in a second, it's not a flaw. There's nothing wrong with NAND. This is an inherent design decision that was made way before anyone ever pressed silicon. This is intrinsically how the hardware works. And it has to work this way, but because it does work that way, we can take advantage of it and make it do really stupid things. Um, and there's really no fix except for shifting away from using NAND, which no one's going to do because NAND is in all of our cell phones, it's in all of our printers, it's in all of our SCADA devices, it's in all of our embedded systems, it's in most of our laptop SSD drives. This is everywhere nowadays, and it's insecure. Anyway, I'll let you decide if it's insecure or just interesting. But let's talk about how NAND works. Um, and I always try to caveat this as... If you know more about NAND than I'm covering here, please, I'm generalizing things to explain them, so please don't troll me on stage. Um, so NAND, NAND is basically this huge series of buckets, um, and each bucket holds one single electron. And these buckets are, as typical with computer type things, they are organized into pages. And then those pages are combined in the blocks. Um, so at the block level, we have basically half a meg that we can address at a time. Um, and that's typically when you hear about like block devices. I mean, where that's 
we start getting into a comfort level of how this hardware works when we deal at a block level. Um, the interesting thing about NAND is it's originally set all to FFs. Like whenever you have a wiped clean NAND, it's all Fs. And that's because every single bucket has an electron in it. Because NAND is basically every single bucket is a trap that traps an electron. If there's an electron in the bucket, it's a one. If you release the electron, it's a zero. It's exceedingly easy to release a single bucket. It's exceedingly hard to catch one random electron. So NAND works in a way where it's, you start with LFs and just like you're a, a sculptor carving marble, you start carving your data away. But you can't easily add back to NAND once you've released that electron. The only way that the hardware lets you do that is to open up and catch 512 electrons again. Um, it can't individually catch. So you can never shift from a zero back to a one. Um, unless you do it at a block level. And because you're talking about something that is exceedingly small and crafted and can catch single electrons, um, you're talking about something that's fragile, right? It's just mass producing something that is that sophisticated at that tiny of a level is very fragile. NAND breaks. Every single gate in NAND, um, and I guess this was last year's numbers of 10 to 100,000 writes that you can get on an AND chip. Now you're looking at maybe a million, but still, they're designed to fail. Um, and because they're designed to fail, there's a whole bunch of protection mechanisms built into the system that lets you elegantly fail. So it's a controlled failure. They know from the get-go, from the design, before they even press silicone, that this is going to fail. So let's build in mechanisms to make sure that we don't lose all of our data when it does. Um, they do things like wear leveling, so you're not always writing on the same block every time you want to write. Um, they're doing things like controlled writes and, and very, very controlled ways that the hardware is actually letting itself be manipulated to make sure that it fails slowly. But at the end of the day, it still does have to fail. And that's where we take advantage of it. The quick aside on NAND, um, there's two different types of NAND that you'll see in the wild. There's what's called raw NAND and managed NAND. The only real difference that we care about here is that raw NAND, everything is managed at the driver and kernel layer. Whereas in managed NAND, there's actually a small microprocessor running the exact same code that would be in the kernel, but it's actually embedded on the chip. Um, so everything I talk about here could easily be ported over to managed NAND. It's just one step harder, and it, there's, there's no payoff. We don't, we don't learn anything more by writing embedded code than we do mucking with the Linux kernel. Um, so, and I can't release that stuff publicly because that violates all types of NDAs and stuff. So, I can talk about the open source work. Um, so, yeah. Wrong end, because it does everything at the kernel layer, has a very complex driver. Um, and then, yeah, I guess this is like, um, the way leveling method, methods that things like NAND do are very close source. Um, you don't really know what's going on. It's very difficult for forensics to look at NAND because no one really knows how that wear leveling works. Um, but everything fails. So in Linux and in Android and probably under the hood in any other phone or device you have, um, you're dealing with the MTD subsystem. It's kind of like a meta driver. Uh, Android users are like crazy on boot partitions. Um, and in some phones, it's also just used to raw, manage raw NAND across the device. Um, so yeah, we fail. Uh, we fail in a controlled way. The way this works is when NAND fails, NAND starts recognizing that the data that's supposed to be stored and it's supposed to be sending back uh, isn't perfect anymore. We've swapped a bit here, we've swapped a bit there. There's a threshold of how many bits can be swapped before NAND raises a flag and says, this block is bad, never trust to write to me again. Um, and that way you've got error corrections and whatnot, but once you hit that threshold, that block of NAND is just gone from the system. That's how it controls um, making sure your data is, is resident and good. So when it flips that bit, it's a single bit that just says, I was good, oh, I'm bad. Um, when it's bad, the kernel goes, I never want to write there again, so the kernel forgets about it. The NAND itself starts protecting itself, and basically anytime you try to read or write from that block of NAND, 
man goes, no, don't, don't trust me, don't, don't use me, I don't exist. Um, so the hardware stops even reporting that that block is physically there. It's just gone from the system, which is interesting. Um, so that little bit is stored in a couple different places depending on what type of NAND you have, but it's always stored. Sometimes it's stored um, in kernel memory and then it's written back to NAND in a special place. Sometimes it's stored at the beginning or the end of the bad block. Sometimes it's... Um, those bits are just stored in one huge array at the whole beginning or end of NAND as itself, but it's always stored. You always have a bad block table basically saying trust, don't trust. Um, so we want to attack that, right? Because um, we want to be able to do things like hide. And how do you hide? And it'd be really interesting if we could hide by just marking whatever sections of NAND we're on as bad, and then nothing sees them. Um, that's really, really simple. Let's do that. Um, so here's all the attack services up and down the chain from hardware all the way up to user land that we could poke at this and start trying to mark things bad. So NANDX. Um, I'm going to be arbitrarily mark blocks of NAND as bad. Once I do that, I want to be able to read and write from them still, right? But I don't want anything else to be able to do it. And if they get marked bad, they automatically disappear off everyone else's radar. So all I need to be able to do is mark it bad and still make sure I can read and write. Um, and I want to make sure that any forensics tools also don't work against this. So even things like DD can't pull my data because if I'm trying to do something really advanced and protect that $20 million investment from 10 minutes ago, um, I don't want to be found ever. Um, so can we do that? Um, what I expected when I kind of came up with this idea was a lot of reverse engineering of hardware because that's what I do for a living and that's what I like. Um, what I ended up doing is going shopping. Uh, I bought about 30 phones, bought them, booted them up, looked at them, yay raw NAND, yay not raw NAND, um, sold them back on eBay. Like I said, I bought a lot of phones and I sold them back on eBay. Uh, if you bought phones on eBay um, earlier this year, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, try, I did not break uh, anything that I sold back. So, and then I found this thing, which was really cool, because when you look at cap partitions, you can basically see MTD block zero. That is raw NAND. Um, MTD block one, that's raw NAND. You don't actually get into managed NAND until MMC block zero down at the bottom. So I've got four huge partitions that are all being managed in the kernel. That's a lot of space for me to be able to play with, be able to hide data in, um, and poke around. And then I notice at the bottom that those partitions are system, apps log, cache, and user data. So I've got huge swaths of memory that I can basically, from the kernel, hide in. Um, and just got tons of space, so I can do whatever I want. So I looked a little further down in the NTD subsystem and realized that they had a whole, in every device that I've seen Android on the market, they actually ship the unit test for these things as kernel modules uh, that you can just sideload at any time uh, on your running device. They just, I don't know why they compile them and leave them in. You'd think they'd want to save a little space, but they don't. So I just added a couple more. Um, and the code that I call to do this uh, basically is the exact same API that the typical driver uses. The only exception is I have to circumvent a couple checks for the out-of-bounds write uh, to flip that bit, bit in the bad block table. Um, and then I have to circumvent one more check basically when I'm trying to write to a write or read from the block, the very first thing any of the driver calls do is say, is this block bad? Um, but if you look at the actual code for those, which I've got documented like crazy, it says, is this block bad? If it's not, then call this other function that's just one level lower. So I didn't really actually have to change the API, write my own code, and just jump one level lower and call the raw reader write. Um, but no other tools are doing that, and I don't know why. So before we go too much further, I'll show a video demo of hiding. Um, which is kind of hard to do. Like, my, my video demos are really lame, and I'm sorry, but it's, uh, I'm trying to hide things. That's, that's difficult to demo. Um, so I'm, I'm ends modding the kernel module right here that we're going to go through the code in a second. And it loads on the device, and we reboot. And that's all we really see. But what happened? Um... Cool, I'm back. Um, 
that's what really happened. Uh, I wiped block 37. I said block 37 on land, you are no longer good, you are a bad block, don't, don't ever get used again. Um, and then I wrote dead beef to the whole thing. Uh, when I randomly picked block 37, I didn't realize it until you saw the phone reboot, but um, that's where com.androids.settings, so the settings app is for Android on this device. So when I rebooted, um, <laughs> you can see, unfortunately, it stopped because half of it's now just dead beef and it's gone. Um, and I actually force, in the demo code that I've released on GitHub, I actually double free um, the hardware pointer, so I force a reboot just because I want to immediately see that that block is no longer there. Um, and because I hate puzzles that don't actually do code, let's, let's dive a little bit in. Um, here's the source. Uh, it's really easy. You can see I wrote a function that moves all the data from that block to another block. Um, it actually isn't implemented because I'm lazy, but if someone else was going to do this, it'd be the right way to do it. Um, so I erase the block. I don't really have to, but it was easier in this case. I erase everything. Um, I write dead beef to the block, and then I mark it as bad. Um, and then it disappears from the system, and you no longer see it. The marking a bad call is actually the interesting one. Um, there is a framework call that basically lets the kernel say, this is bad. And then it always fails. Um, but if you dig down one level deeper, you can manually just write that bit and uh, I've never ever seen this fail on any device I've booked on. So we have written to a block, um, we've marked it bad, it's gone, nothing can see it anymore. But I wanted to make sure it worked, so I wrote some tools that actually could read and write arbitrarily back to that. Um, so right after, right after we killed that block, I ran this, and we can see that this is a brand new, fresh virgin phone that came out of the shrink wrap and um, got abused right away. So there originally weren't any bad blocks. I ran up my tool. Now I've got one bad block on block 37 that is completely covered in dead beef. Um, how deep is it? Once it's marked bad, there's no tool on the market that exists at all to mark a block good again. It's illogical that one would exist because these things are supposed to fail and say, don't trust me to store your data because I'm not trustworthy. So there's no tool that just goes, oh yeah, I'll flip that bit back. And the hardware actually fights you if you try to flip that bit back. Um, because of that, like a factory reset or something like that doesn't reclaim it. Like you can reinstall Android a hundred times. You can throw a whole bunch of different ROMs on there. Uh, I don't care. I'm still half a meg of dead beef is still just sitting at block 37. No matter what you do to your phone, um, I'm going to have dead beef on that phone when it dissolves in a landfill in like 5,000 years. Like it's, I am there, I'm hidden for good, and unless you run the man find tool, like even DD is not going to find me. It's pretty cool. Um, so I hid, and that was interesting, but I started thinking, how can I actually use this? Like, yeah, I want to I want to hide a kit, and that's a good way to hide a kit on disk. Uh, cool. Um, what if I just wanted to exfiltrate a whole bunch of data? Well, if I could target that data on someone else's hard drive, all I have to do is start marking those blocks bad, at which point things like secure wipe of a drive aren't going to touch those, which means even if IT comes and gets your laptop because you're like, dude, my hard drive's dead. They come, they get it, they wipe it, they do all this secure stuff, and then at some point it goes in the dumpster. All I have to do is target and wipe your stuff and wait until it goes in the dumpster, pick it up, and now I can read all that data because I, I hid it from you, but I can still read it. Um, that was a little more interesting, but dumpsters aren't that much fun. So I uh, kind of shifted again and just went, wait, I'm... I'm killing a device. That's essentially what I'm doing is I'm almost like Pac-Man. I'm eating half a meg of data off your drive that's no longer there. So every time I kill a block, you have one less block that you could ever use. What if I kind of take that to the next level? Um, <coughs> so I kind of revisited my kernel, kernel module, but now instead of actually removing one, I just remove like 100 blocks at a time. Um, and I do this, you know, it's a kernel module, so if I've got root, I can sideload this remotely. Um, and I don't really do exploitation, so I'm just assuming I've got root because someone bought no day for me. Um, but at that point, I can kill your drive. I can eat your drive completely. Your drive is still there. All the data is there. 
but you can't use it, and I can eat so much of your drive before I let a reboot happen that when you try to reboot, there's no hard drive left to boot from. Your whole OS is gone, all of your data is gone, you have a brick. If that's a phone, you're pissed off. If that's SCADA or an industrial control system or something that's like, you know, some pipeline between Texas and Alaska that's in the middle of nowhere that that flow controller is at, um, I just killed that thing, and that's really dangerous. Um, and I probably shouldn't be allowed to do that. So that, in a nutshell, is why NAND is insecure. Um, I don't really know how to fix it. I kind of like to give this talk because I just really like feedback on like, okay, how would you catch me? Like that would be really cool. Um, but everything I've done is released on GitHub. All the source code is there. Um, I've got like a 100 page document I wrote on this. If you really want to geek out on low level stuff, it's all there. Um, cool, I've got time. So we can hide, and that's fun. Um, but no matter how well we hide, at some point we're going to run up against an adversary that can find us. And if my whole goal is to never get found, if my whole goal is to never, ever, ever show up in the New York Times for whatever I'm doing, um, I don't want to ever get found, I don't want to ever be reverse engineered. So if I detect that something's happening, I need to get off that device. Um, you know, maybe someone figures out how to beat my NAND tool, but regardless, I need to get off that device or that device needs to be dead. So my hypothesis, because I'm a scientist, um, was given the full control of the kernel in the Android phone, I should be able to control voltage. I should be able to control all the power. Um, when I can control that power, what can I do? My guess at the time was that I can target and overvolt or undervolt parts, actual physical parts on the PCB of the phone and fry them um, to where they're just dead, never functional again. Um, and my hypothesis was surprisingly correct. I was actually a little let down that it was... Um, well, it was hard, but it, it, I was hoping it would be harder. Um, so the battery stores raw power, right? Like, that makes logical sense. We all kind of get that. Um, USB also pushes power to the phone to charge the battery. We kind of get that, too. Um, internal to the silicon of the phone, you've got these things called PMIX. Um, power the modulation IC, if I remember correctly. They're basically little bitty microcontrollers that are really dumb, but all they do is just say, ah, you said to give 2.3 volts down this power line, so I'm going to, and that power line may go to the screen, that power line may go to the Wi-Fi chip, whatnot. There's a whole bunch of these on the phone, and they're all very, very, very well documented. So you've got stored power, and you've got a way to control it, and that thing listens to the kernel and does whatever the kernel says to do. Um, if someone was good at hardware design, not to bash the people that actually do it for a living, but if they were very protective of this type of attack, they would load every single trace with capacitors and resistors, which are cheap on an individual level, but when you're mass producing a million phones, I guess it's costly. I, I, I don't know. It still seems like it'd be trivial. Um, so I wanted to start poking at this and actually targeting. And the first thing I found was the documentation power slash regulator slash overview dot text. This thing is awesome because it explains everything that happens with Linux power routing. Not just Android, but anything that is Linux or Linux derivative, this is how it works. Um, and it basically points you to a couple of C and dot H files in the kernel that control this. Um, the main one being whatever your uh, board that you're actually mucking with, it has a driver just think your motherboard would have a driver, the PCB of the phone has a driver. This .c has a underscore regulator file that is this huge file that just lists all the different PMIX that are on that PCB and what voltages they should be pushing where. Um, so all you have to do is change those voltages. Because I have this thing with using Sony, um, for no reason other than not many people care about Sony, so they're kind of fun. Um, I used the Xperia Z for this. And as an aside, when I started doing this research, I realized that at this level, every single cell phone on the market is the same. Um, 
because every single cell phone runs a Qualcomm Snapdragon chip these days. Every single one of them, uh, I guess Apple runs their own thing, but I mean, the Windows phone, 99% of the Android phones are now running a Qualcomm Snapdragon. Um, at one point, some engineers at Qualcomm sat down and went, we need to sell more chips, let's design a reference platform phone that basically showcases how to put our chip on a phone and use it. Um, and so they started selling these to people like Sony. And Sony gets it and goes, oh, that's how you build a phone. I, I never knew. Um, and so Sony gets this phone. Well, HTC gets it, and Motorola gets it, and everyone else gets it. And everyone bases their, their design of the actual phone on this reference platform. So when you start looking at power regulation, and you try to do a diff between the various manufacturers of phones, they're identical. They may have different screens or different cameras or whatnot. You may see like one value change, but for the most part, um, at this layer, we're talking about a universal exploit that isn't tied to a single vendor, or isn't tied even to an OS. It's intrinsically, this is how silicon works, and this is the very low-level driver that mucks with it. Um, so we can start targeting things because we can control the individual PMIX. Um, and for this demo, and if you're more curious about this, I wrote the whole thing up in Pocker GTFO for Travis Goodspeed um, that just published a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I'll be publishing all the research soon. But to target NAND, we can see in the kernel diff here, NAND used to pull in 2.95 volts. That's how much voltage NAND needed to run. Um, so I just upped it to 5.9. Uh, and there's two different PMIX that control the power that goes into NAND. So now, every time you try to read or write NAND, instead of getting basically 3 volts, you get 6. Um, what this does is it it corrupts every single read uh, that you try to do off NAND. Like if you try to read from a block of NAND, it pulls this power down there and actually like kills that little block. So it's it's another way to like target fry a little block of NAND, which is, is fun. Um, and you corrupt the crap out of the data so it can't be pulled out. Every time you try to write, the same thing happens. You actually fry the wood. Um, PMIX, because they're really, really dumb, they just remember the last setting they were given. So if you notice your phone acting quirky and it's like just not loading things correctly and you reboot, because that's what we're taught to do from the Windows world, um, you know, if it doesn't work, reboot, right? Well, when you reboot, that PMIX is still trying to read and write with six volts. So every time it tries to read off NAND, which would be loading the whole OS into memory, which is a huge chunk of NAND, it's going to just fry the whole thing. Um, and then we get a very dead phone, very, very, very dead. Uh, in a very targeted, controlled way, because the rest of the hardware still works. We just wiped NAND. Um, but what if we do it the other way? What if instead of overvolting and killing the hardware, what if we just neuter the hardware so it doesn't work? So I basically half the voltage. When I do that, we can still sometimes read. It gets corrupted because there's not enough power going in to actually transfer the data. But we still, for the most part, read. But every write fails. Um, which means you basically just inserted a write blocker into your phone um, accidentally. So if you're targeting someone and want them to not be able to erase any data off their phone, boom, half the voltage that goes into NAND, and they can't get rid of any evidence. Um, it's kind of a fun trick. It, it wasn't going after it, and then it was like, oh, that'll work, and it, it worked really well. Um, so basically, whenever you sideload that kernel module, your NAND just stays the exact way it is. You'll still boot, you get a little quirky because it's underpowered, but you can never write. Um, and like the last thing I'll talk about with Boner is, so NAND was one of the 10 different uh, components of the phone that I attacked. I attacked trying to fry the actual main processors. I tried to attack frying individual cores in the multi-core processor. I, uh, attacked frying the Wi-Fi chip, the Bluetooth chip, the USB hardware. Um, I have a long report of exactly how to attack every single component. Um, but other than NAND, one of the things that we started, that I started noticing really quickly is Thermal D would catch things, because Thermal D is designed on the phone to check how hot things are. So if you're overclocking a processor that's supposed to be running 
you know, 2 gigahertz, and now you tell it, here's enough voltage to run at 99 gigahertz. Well, the thing's not going to be able to do it, but it's going to try because you told it it could, um, and then Thermal D goes, dude, you're getting really hot, and just shuts the whole thing down. Um, so if you're going to be poking at this, if you're curious and just want to poke a little more, um, remember that you always need to new Thermal D. Thermal D has to be running for the system to be running. There's just way too many checks in the kernel to not do that. But if you look at the actual code, it's talking back and forth everywhere, and then whenever it gets out of bounds, it just like does a kernel fault. So all you need to do is just comment out that one line of code. Go ahead and let it complain. Um, it can complain all at once. As long as it doesn't cause a reboot, you're fine. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about burner uh, probably within a couple of months. I just finished the research and I'm prepping it for release, um, trying to make sure it can't directly be weaponized off GitHub. So I hope what I've done today is try to convince you that rootkits and malware aren't always boring, because you can start doing really advanced tools and fun things there. Um, and if you're a reverse engineer, you can find really cool and interesting things. Um, once we shift away from the boring, just I want to send spam or I want to steal credit cards. Um, and as always, I would urge you to open source anything you do and to just start questioning your devices and how they work at a very low level. Um, questions? So. Uh, you were talking about a little bit earlier about you know, you were able to exert and uh, work at a huge work with a ton of the same kind of things that are out of bad blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, were you able to execute anything from that bad block? Uh, yes, so the question is, was I able to execute anything from that bad block? Um, you're typically never actually executing off of NAND, right? You're like loading it into RAM and then you're executing. So yeah, I can load, I can load into RAM and execute just fine. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. Nothing else can see it. None of the forensics tools that are on the market today can see it. Um, there are some very advanced flags for DD, which is kind of a very low-level forensics tool that's been around for ages, that claim they can get bad blocks. Um, and I've only seen one pull my data off a drive like one in 10, one in 20 times. It's really sketchy on whether they work at all. Um, and what I don't talk about on, on GitHub or the presentation is because no one really understands how that wear leveling works, it's not open source, I can start taking advantage of that. And instead of just writing half a meg of dead beef, you know, I can just intersperse um, my actual executable shell code or what whatever I have um, in what looks like garbage and it just becomes really, really difficult to find me. Um, but yeah, you can execute, yeah. Um, so the question is, is this an easy way to make, to basically do a secure wipe? Um, yeah, so the answer is no, because um, your data is still there. You're actually not, you're not wiping it at all. Um, the problem, one of the other problems with NAND that God, I hope someone does some research and talks about is when you say secure wipe your NAND, you expect just like with a magnetic drive for it to actually wipe it. But that embedded NAND controller or the MTD subsystem goes, dude, we have so few writes that we can actually do to this. I'm going to tell you I wiped your data, but I'm not actually going to do it because I don't want to waste that cycle. Um, so you're starting to get things like secure drives that will let you do it, but for a long time, guys would go like, yes, write ones and zeros over it 12 times and it's totally secure. And NAND would just go, yeah, I did that. No. Um, so, but if, if you did wipes like that, if you actually did a low level, you could use my tools to get in and force zeros and force ones. Um, and if you did that, then you could mark them bad, but it's almost irrelevant at that point because it should be gone. You don't get the same type of residue that you do with um, the magnetized drives. I mean, it's really hard to forensically analyze an AND device. And then if you're talking about like electron residue on that charge, like it, it's, there's not tools to do that either. And, and this is, doesn't matter that's single. No, not at all. Um, you mentioned that you still have a lot of 
Uh, oh no, Apple uses NAND. Everyone uses NAND. It's just um, Apple is. It's harder to get into. Um, I mean, uh, Android's open source, so it's really easy for me to just be able to pull up the kernel and talk about it without. One of the things I ran into, my original attack was all the um, managed NAND that basically have small Turing machines in them that make sure everything works. And when I started going down that path, I realized that if I wanted to talk about it on stage ever, I am basically dumping out that vendor's special sauce all over the place. And that would open me up to getting sued for, even though I haven't signed an NDA, I'm basically publicizing all of their their secret sauce. And there was no reason to. Um, so the vulnerability. The vulnerability is there in, in iPhone um, just as much as it is uh, in an industrial control system. It's everywhere. So. You mentioned that the PMIC can, can be changed with a boot or any is designed to be changed at boot, but it can be changed at runtime. So you can effectively create a so where your software is hiding and you say, hey, before you come find me, undervolt it, you'll able to find me. Yes, yes you can. Um, and PMICs are designed to be, well, the kernel is designed to typically deal with most of that on boot. Um, one of the stages of bootloader is like you initialize all the hardware and that's where it gets set. But especially with things like processors, um, you run them at different voltages depending on how much processing you're doing at the system at the time. So they are already set up to be dynamic. Um, so at any arbitrary time, you can drop the value to NAND and back up. The only thing you have to realize is that PMIX are really dumb and really, really slow. Um, so you have to account for that if you're trying to hide something in particular. Cool. Well, thank you. I'm Josh.